The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Stormy Weather. As Kitty Gabron stood at the window of her husband's office, 19 floors above the street, she could have seen the black edge of cloud on the horizon. But Kitty wasn't looking for a storm. No, for at this moment she was as happy as she could ever be. Forgotten were the one-night stands, the dirty dressing rooms, the cheap hotels and long hours of rehearsals. All that remained of those seven years she'd spent as an actress, with the grace, the poise that she'd learned so well, the ways of talking, looking, and walking that had first attracted Dr. Rims Gabra. Yes, something good had come out of those bitter years, a home, security, and love. But at this moment, Kitty had no way of knowing that, that all this, everything she'd worked for would soon be threatened. And now, as the first distant rumble of thunder drifted in through the open window, Kitty's laughter covered up the sound. Oh, Rim. Rim, darling, please. What's this? Resist me, will you? <laughs> now, see here, young lady. You're the only wife I've ever had in only three months of that. <laughs> and you'll have to expect to be kissed every time you come into my office. What will Miss Anderson say if she happens to open the door? What every good nurse should say when she catches the doctor kissing his wife. Nothing. <laughs> you told me yourself. Doctors have to be respectable to stay in business. <laughs> come here. Oh, Rim. Rims, darling, I do love you so very much. I don't think I ever really lived until I found you, Kitty. Such a charming liar. You never needed me at all, really. You've always had your work. Work? Hm. My patients have been in jeopardy ever since I first met you. <laughs> Why, I... Oh, excuse me, doctor. Mr. Gunther's here. Oh, fine. Uh, in a minute, Miss Anderson. No. Doctor will see Mr. Gunther right now. All right, all right. That's what I get for having an office in the Star Times building. Right across from the city editor, and he always has a headache. And you're the best brain surgeon in the world. You take good care of Mr. Gunther. Bye, darling. Bye. Hiya, Doc. Say, I got that headache again, and... Oh, excuse me, I... Hello, Mrs. Gabron. Didn't know you were here. I was just leaving, Mr. Gunther. Well, don't rush off on my account. I... Hello, Gunther. What are you doing here, Niles? Your secretary said you stepped across the hall, so I trailed over. Why don't you introduce me, Gunther? You used to introduce me to all your friends. Uh, this is Niles Keating, Dr. and Mrs. Gabron. How do you do? I am particularly interested in meeting Mrs. Gabron. What? Now, see here, Niles, this is downright impolite. Sure, but then I never made much copy as a gentleman. <sighs> Dr. and Mrs. Gabron, I must apologize. Niles is a former business acquaintance of mine, and I... And now he's a rum hound who can't get a job on any paper in the country. I beg your pardon, Doctor. Mrs. Gabron, I was rude. Now that everyone's unbearably uncomfortable, I'll leave. I'll wait in your office, Constance. Don't bother. Suit yourself. I'm terribly sorry. Mrs. Gabron, I had no idea. Oh, oh it's quite all right. Forget it, Gunther. I, um, 
I think I'll run along, Rims. I'll see you at dinner. All right, darling. Bye, Mrs. Gabrin. Oh, uh, oh, Kitty. Yes? Be careful driving home. Looks like we're in for a bit of stormy weather. Yes. Yes, it does. Suddenly, there's a cloud over the sun, and the sky grows dark and ugly. But it isn't the storm that worries you, is it, Kitty? It's the tall, unshaven man named Niles Keating. There's something familiar about him. A grim, frightening shadow who somehow seems to belong to your past. As you step out of the elevator and hurry out into the street, a gust of cold wind envelops you. You shudder. And then as you cross to the parking lot, you see Niles Keating lounging against the side of the building, watching you with that same odd, cold look. You're gonna need an umbrella. I... I have my car. A green one? Yes. I had one like that once. Now I walk. Can I drop you off anywhere, Mr. Keating? I remember when you didn't have a car. Oh? We've met before? Not exactly. We, uh, had a mutual friend. A guy you knew before you met the doc. Your name was Kitty James then, wasn't it? Before I was married, yes. Before you had a nice, shiny new car like this one. Yeah. It's real classy. Smooth lines. It's, uh... Just the kind of a car for a doll like you, Kitty. You've been drinking, Mr. Keating. Sure, sure. I've been doing it for five years. What do you want of me? Maybe we could do a little talking? About what? Well, I could give you a thumbnail sketch of myself as a starter. Niles Keating. Used to be a pretty big name in the business. Good job, nice apartment, nice friends. Know where I live now? No, but I'm not... Room over a garage. I dug up the wrong story one day, five years ago. Reporter shouldn't do that. Wash me up fast. You know what I've been doing since? Really, Mr. Keaton? Working. I'm... Covering all kinds of stories. None of them ever written up, mind you, but I've been on the job every day. Every day looking for one story that would put me back in the business. Well, I'm sure you'll find it. I have, Kitty. I have found it. That's fine, but I'm not interested. It's about one of those successful people who used to come around to see me. A guy named Tim Brady. Tim Brady? Remember him? I... No. Oh, cut it out, sweetheart. Cut it out. Come on, let's ease into your little green wagon and go for a ride. Uh, maybe you'll buy me a drink, huh? You, you pick the place. Okay, I'll pick. As you drive through the downpour with Niles Keating by your side, the fear within you grows steadily, like the fury of the storm outside. And the nightmare, the horror of that evening weeks ago, returns to you now, the night when Tim Brady died. Your car moves slowly along the rain-swept streets. And occasionally you glance at the figure of the man in the trench coat, slumped down in the seat beside you. There's the bare trace of a smile on his lips as he stares into the storm. And you wonder how much he knows what he'll say. You're afraid he knows all about you. Yet you wait in silence. Wait for him to make the first move. There's still a chance he's guessing, isn't there, Kitty? The minutes drag on. You sit behind the wheel, tense, waiting, waiting. And then as you leave the downtown traffic behind you... <laughs> relax, baby. You're holding onto that wheel like you were afraid it's going to get away from you. Relax, relax. Here, uh, have a cigarette. Thank you, no. Okay. Now, uh, about that drink, I know a nice, cute I've little I've been waiting spot. for you to talk, Mr. Keating. What's on your mind? Tim Brady, a racketeer, but a pretty good guy in some ways. It's too bad he got himself killed one night in his apartment. I read all about it in the papers. Gang killing, wasn't it? Well, the police figured a guy named Dutch Jensen had done it. He was seen in the neighborhood that night. He and Brady weren't very close pals. Dutch got his a week later, trying to get away from the cops. 
He died before they could get anything out of him about the Brady shooting. The police were convinced he'd done it. Sure, sure. So, after Brady's funeral, a kid sister of his back in Duluth asked me to go over to Tim's apartment and close it up, send her Tim's stuff. So I did. I, uh, happened to find something in the apartment. Oh? You see, the apartment manager described a woman who'd been to see Tim the night he was killed. Her description fits yours to a T. Sure, the cops were certain Dutch was the killer, but the newspapers saw another angle. They figured this woman might have been a very close friend of Tim's. Maybe she... Yes, I, um, I read about that, too. The papers called her the mystery woman. It's corny, but good copy. Never did locate her, though. It would make a great story if somebody could tell them who she was. You, uh, look cold. The storm bother you? What do you know about the mystery woman? I can tell them exactly who she is. Who? You. That's stupid. Is it? Who would believe you? You said yourself you can't get a job on any newspaper because... That was then. This is now. You have proof, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. A woman's glove. I found it stuffed down between the sofa cushions. Took me quite a while to trace that glove, Kitty. Department stores, cleaning establishments, just like in the movies. That, I suppose, proves I was there that night. Well, I wasn't sure you were. Not until a few minutes ago. But I am now, Kitty. Uh, look, pull over the curb and let me off. I can use a drink even if you can. Listen to me. I hadn't seen Tim Brady in over three years. I only went there that night because I wanted to get some letters I'd written him before I met Rims. Foolish, girlish letters. There was no trouble. He gave them to me. Sure, sure, sure. Pull over, huh? I tell you, it's the truth. I don't care why you wanted to see him. The point is, you were there. Well, what do you expect to get out of this? A headline that's going to read... Mystery woman found, doctor's wife implicated in Brady case. Mr. Keating, perhaps we can make some arrangements. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Save it. I'm not a blackmailer, Kitty. I'm a newspaper man, and this story will put me back in the league. I've already left a message with Gunther's secretary telling him I have all the proof he needs. In another hour, I'll tell him who the mystery woman is. Please, please listen to me. You're wasting your time, sweetheart. Dig up some old files on me. You'll find I'm just as bad as you think I am. With the prologue of Stormy Weather, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. One evening recently, while doubling in the role of babysitter, I was telling our neighbor's little son about Santa Claus, how Santa comes all the way down from the North Pole nonstop. Gosh, Marvin, the little fellow exclaimed, Santa Claus must use that famous go-farther gasoline you talk about on the radio. (laughs) Well, reluctantly, I had to admit that Santa uses a sleigh powered by reindeer. But if Santa did use gasoline, you can bet that he'd be interested in Signal's good mileage. And since Santa knows quality, he'd certainly appreciate Signal's quick cold weather starting, Signal's lively pickup, Signal's smoothest skating power. That's why you can put Marvin Miller on record as saying, if Santa ever trades Prancer and Dancer and Dunder and Blitzen for a car, I predict Mr. Claus will power it with Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. So the one-time cracked newspaper man, Niles Keating, has stepped into your life, Kitty. And suddenly, everything that was so sure, so certain, has vanished. 
He knows that you're the much sought after mystery woman in the Brady killing. And soon the whole story will appear on the front pages of every newspaper in the country. As you watch him walk away from your car, half stumble along the rain-swept street. You know this means the end of everything you've wanted and worked for. But there's still a chance you can make him stop the story, plead with him. And then as you open your car door, you hear the screech of brakes. Look out! And look up in time to see a car bear down on him. I saw it all. That guy wasn't watching where he was going. Crossing against the light. Who is he? I don't know. I think I've seen him get out of that green car over there. Anybody call an ambulance? Stand away, everybody. Huh? Let me look. Let me look. Mister. Mister. Hey. Guy's hurt bad. Real bad. Yeah, he sure is. Look at him. He stepped right in front of my car, I tell you. We've seen it, Mac. Is he, uh, is he a friend of yours, lady? I... No. I never saw him before in my life. You step back into the crowd. Wait with him until the ambulance arrives. Watch as a white-coated young intern examines Keating's head injuries and then carefully assists in loading him into the ambulance. As they drive off with him, Kitty, you, you suddenly find yourself admitting that you're glad it happened. Oh, Miss Gabron, I thought you'd never get home. Goodness, I hope you didn't get soaked. I'm sorry I'm late, Hilda. I was delayed. I was just getting ready to leave your note, ma'am. You may go now if you wish. Oh, thank you, Miss Gabbard. Dinner's all cooked. All you have to do is warm up. Miss Gabbard, you feel all right? Yes, yes, of course. Oh, you look so pale. I'm just tired, Hilda. Oh, can I fix you something before I go? A cup of hot tea? No, no, thanks. Sure? I'll, I'll be fine. I'll rest until the doctor comes home. You run along now. Mm-hmm. All right, then. See you in the morning, Miss Gabbard. Goodbye, Hilda. Bye. Yes? Hello? Hello, is this Dr. Gabrin's residence? Yes, this is Mrs. Gabrin speaking. Oh, oh, Mrs. Gabrin, I didn't recognize your voice. Uh, this is Miss Anderson at the doctor's office. Yes? Could I speak to the doctor, please? Why, I thought he was at the office. He left more than two hours ago, said he was going to make a hospital call and then go right home early. Well, I can have him call you. It's very urgent. I tried to locate Lucas and Desmond, but they're both out of town. The hospital's been calling every five minutes. What is it, Miss Anderson? An accident case at City Hospital. I'm afraid Dr. Gabbard is the only man equipped to operate. I'll tell Rims as soon as he gets in. You better have him call the hospital direct. All right. And whom shall he ask for? Surgery. The patient is Mr. Niles Keating. Keating? Yes, Mr. Gunther's friend. He was hurt this afternoon. Oh, Oh, I forgot you met him. And Rims? Dr. Gabrin is the only one who can operate? Yes, if Dr. Gabrin gets to him in time. He has a chance. It's almost more than you can bear, isn't it, Kitty? Too much for one day that began so perfectly, only to turn into a wild nightmare of confusion... Your mind spins. The room seems to go in and out of focus until everything goes black before your eyes. Kitty. Kitty, what happened? What happened, Kitty? What's the matter, darling? Grim. Oh, and it is you. Yes, darling. What happened? I... I guess I fainted. Rims. Hold me, darling. Hold me tight. Of course, of course. Never let me go, never. Of course not. Oh, Rims. Oh, poor darling. I don't look after you the way I should. I... Just hold me. I, I'm so frightened, Rims. Now, there's nothing to be frightened about, and there's no reason you should be trembling. I'm such a fool. It was so silly of me to faint. I... I came home and had a slight hit. I'll take care of that in a minute, darling. I'm always so busy taking care of other people, I forgot the most important one. From now on, darling, I'm spending a lot more time with you. Uh, here you are, Kitty. 
Grims, what? Now, now, you just take this. It'll help calm you. But I... Go on, doctor's orders. Oh, all right. Here, I'll take the glass. You just sit back and relax. Oh, Rim, I love you so much. I love you too, Kitty. <laughs> I'm here, darling. You feeling better? All right. I must have fallen asleep. Mm -hmm. That was a sedative I gave you. You dropped right off. Oh, Rims. Kitty, what's the matter? How long have I been asleep? Mm -hmm. About two hours. Two hours? No, no, sit back. Rims, wait. I, I, I've got to... Don't say anything now, honey. Just relax. Like the fire? Oh, uh, yes, yes. It's nice, but and I've got... And it's going out on us if I don't get some more wood. I'll have to go back to the shed. Be right back. Rims, wait. Uh, uh... Seems we have a caller. I'll answer it. No, don't trouble, Kitty. I don't want you to no, move. I feel fine, Rims, really. You get the wood. I'll answer the door. Well, all right. You wait, Kitty, making sure that your husband is outside the house before you go to the door. But as you open it, the dark, heavy figure in the shiny raincoat glances at you accusingly. It's Gunther, the city editor, and you wonder how much he knows. Hello, Mrs. Gabron. Hello, Sorry, I didn't answer right away. I, I was sleeping. Well, this has been quite a night for me. But running all over town looking for your husband. I phoned here several times, but I kept getting a busy signal. Oh? Is he here? No. Well, I guess my trip was for nothing then. Is there anything I can do for you? It's about Keating. Hospital phoned you, I guess. They tell me Dr. Gabbin's the only one that can do the job. Yes, that's, uh, that's what Miss Anderson said. Do you have any idea where he could be? No. That seems funny, darn funny. You're very concerned for Mr. Keating? Well, he worked for me once. We never got along, but he's a good newspaper man. That's what he said. When? Oh, I mean, that's what I gathered. Uh, well, Keating came to me a couple of days ago about a story. Said he found the mystery woman, the uh, Brady case, you know. I told him I'd have to have proof, and he said he'd get it. Apparently he did. Uh, then this accident happens. And you haven't got your story? Uh, none of it. Well, if the doctor comes in, you'll let him know what's what. Naturally. Keating will die if he isn't operated on soon, Mrs. Gabron. Well, goodbye. Yes, Kitty. Niles Keating will die if he isn't operated on soon. And if he is operated on. He'll tell the story that will identify you as the mystery woman in the Brady case. You stand by the door for a long moment after Gunther drives off in the rain. And then, when you turn around, you're looking into the quiet, questioning eyes of your husband. You can tell him the truth now, Kitty, or you can let Niles Keating die, and your secret will die with him. Who was that at the door, Kitty? It was just a man... He had the wrong address. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a reminder about a faithful friend who I'll bet you've left off your Christmas list, your car. Christmas, you know, is really a swell excuse to give the faithful chariot some of those things it's been needing. Things that pay you back later in extra driving pleasure. What's more, your signal dealer has just what Santa ordered. For instance, rugged new tires by Lee of Conshohocken to replace your smooth, dangerous old tires. Powerful new signal deluxe batteries guaranteed for a full 30 months on a service basis. Or how about a set of new champion spark plugs for quicker, cold-weather starting and more pep? These are just a few of the useful, practical items for your car that you'll find at your signal dealers. You see, signal service stations are much more than just headquarters for the famous go-farther gasoline. In addition, each signal dealer carries a complete line of fine-quality automotive accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now back to the whistler.
It's all over, isn't it, Kitty? And with the coming of the dawn, calm and clear, you sit alone quietly. You keep telling yourself that you've made the right decision. The hours drag on and you wait. Then a door opens quietly. Footsteps move past, white-clad figures. And suddenly, Rims is standing by your side. Come on in, Kitty. He's out of it now. He's all right? Yes. Yes, he's fine. Oh, Rims. Steady, darling. Hello, Mrs. Cabron. Hey, they tell me your husband did quite a job on me. He saved your life. I suppose I should say thanks. I was glad to be of service, Keating. It's my job. Yeah, sure. We've all got our jobs to do. You can thank my wife, too. She told me about you. She drove me here in time to operate. I'm still a reporter, Doc. My job is to get news, not censor it. On the way over here, she also told me all about the Brady affair. The story you're going to print. Does that surprise you, Keating? Uh, let's say I didn't expect her to do it, Doc. I've always told Rims everything. Sorry I didn't tell him about Brady long ago. If you were innocent, well, why didn't you? Because I was afraid he might not believe me. I'm sure your readers wouldn't. Uh-huh. Tim had just given me the letters when the doorbell rang. He told me to wait in the kitchen while he answered it. And then there was a shot. I got panicky and ran out the back way. And the next morning I read that Tim was dead. Naturally, you'd say something like that. I believe what she says, Keating. You see, I know Kitty. And I've read the letters. Hello, Doc. Say, I heard Keating's came around. Yes, Gunther, but he can't be disturbed until tomorrow. Yeah, He's yeah I know, it. I know, but I got to get a story. Only take now, a minute. Now, wait a minute. You can't see him. Come on, Niles. The mystery woman, who is she? You know, Gunther, the doc and I were just discussing that. What? It's a funny thing. When that car hit me, I got an awful wallop. I can't seem to... Remember a thing, Gunther. Amnesia, I guess. Too bad, huh? Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you that those Salvation Army kettles you'll be passing between now and Christmas will provide Yuletide cheer for over a million needy men, women, and children. Even a few pennies that you'll never miss will help to make this Christmas merrier for someone less fortunate. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Lorette Philbrandt, William Conrad, and David Ellis. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by E. Jack Newman and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking... It's the CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.